I'm going to talk to you today about cryptocurrencies, but I'm not, but I'm going to talk about it in a little bit of a left-handed way. Uh, I'm going to try to give you some context historical like Ed and John. I'm also an old floor trader. And, uh, and so I'll try to give you a few stories that will help you hopefully put the discussions. And right now there's a lot of discussions around Bitcoin in particular, cryptocurrencies and distributed ledgers and what their role is in the future of our markets. Um, and uh, uh, I'll give you some context and then we can drill down on Bitcoin the, um, or cryptocurrencies. So as everybody knows, it's a way to convey value without a trusted third-party intermediary. Now, the OCC is one of the world's largest trusted third-party intermediaries, so we should probably have an opinion about this. Um, and, uh, and I'll get to that, although I really hope that at the end of the talk, you guys can arrive at your own conclusions. So this is me. Does John give you a preview? Uh, this is me in 1983. It was my first, literally my first day working on the floor of the Chicago Board of Trade. Um, I was a broker assistant. My father was in a soybean pit. And uh, at that day, when I walked into that exchange, I can tell you that it looked unassailable. It looked like this is fixed and this is the end state. This is a mature business. It had been around for centuries. When I walked onto the floor, as you'd come through the turnstiles on your right was this big board of computer printed weather charts. And on the left was a machine called the Schwarzatron that had time and sales information. Today we would call that market data. And then when you'd walk down onto the floor, you can see the boards up here. It had electronic news feeds and the traded prices of commodities and, and, and financially pro traded products all around the world. And it looked like computerization had been fully adopted, right? Um, and if you'd asked a floor trader at that time, you know, do you need more computerization? They'd have asked for what? The weather doesn't change more frequently. And look, I've got every price that I need. So, uh, and they were the authorities. I mean, they were in this unbelievable building, right? They lorded over the street. And uh, they were the, giant, the Jamie Diamonds of their day. So it looked like end state. It looked like computerization had already happened. And of course, that was massively wrong. When that building was built, the architects, Holabird and Root, uh, put a statue of Demeter on top, or Ceres, the goddess of the harvest. And I don't know if you can see that it's missing um, a face. Does anybody know why it's missing a face? We got two people. They said, we're going to build a story with buildings, so no one's going to see the face. That's right. No one would ever be high enough to see it. And for 35 years, they were more or less right. This was the tallest building in Chicago. This is the Chicago skyline more recently. And if you see the Sears Tower, there's a little white building at the foot of it. And on the top of that is the faceless statue. So, so we have a tendency to misjudge the potential for bigger and better things. Now, the, uh, uh, in 1992, I'll give you an electronic trading version of this. In 1992, I was a trader in the wheat option pit. And I, it made me one of the earliest electronic traders because the Board of Trade had a pilot program in that pit. And they gave us these handheld uh, computers with a stylus and so you could write down your trade. And as soon as you write your trade down, it would pop it up to this infrared dish above the pit. Very computerized. Uh, and like John said, for three hours and 45 minutes, it was sweaty and we'd be jumping and yelling and screaming and sweating and it would slip out of our hand. That's about what those things looked like, right? They were big and they were heavy and when it would slip out of your hand, it would hit somebody because you're in a tightly packed pit and it would really hurt them. Um, so, uh, uh, so after the first week, you know, everybody has cuts and welts and the, the floor medics actually set up right outside the pit and they had a big thing of butterfly bandages to put on us. And uh, so at the first week, they put, they put Velcro and these neoprene things around these computers and they strap them to your hand. But still, you'd go, six bit. And the guy next to you would, you know, get a welt on the top of his head. So electronic trading did not look obvious then. It still looked like something that didn't seem all that promising. And it's not just electronic trading. So I was backed at the time by a guy. My boss had been one of the charter members of the CBOE here. And he told me a story about he had offices in the old Board of Trade building. And one day, gets a knock on the door. And it's this fellow from the University of Chicago. And he's got a way to value options mathematically. And, uh, and he sort of explains his methodology and, you know, offers it to my boss. And my boss says, you know, 
my business is buying call spreads for a credit, which is a locked-in profit, a riskless trade, and tells you how inefficient the markets were in the 70s. Um, and uh, so he said, I wish you well, lots of luck. Um, it was that guy, Fisher Black. Uh, his co-creators won the Nobel Prize for the methodology that he couldn't give away. So, uh, so you know, these things, you know, they're not obvious. And uh, not every story ends up succeeding. So, for example, when I was a kid, we had a cartoon, The Jetsons, and they had flying cars, and I thought that was a possibility. Uh, and in fact, what's happened is that planes have gotten slower, right? Uh, you don't f travel in the air as fast as you used to in the 70s. There's other things that we've gotten wrong. So, uh, in the 70s, there was widespread concern that the Japanese were gonna take over the automotive industry and electronics. And uh, when this, when this uh, magazine cover uh, ran in May of 1971. China was not yet a member of the United Nations, and the GDP per capita of the US to China was 47 times larger. So today, by the way, it's only seven times larger, and this is what happened. Japan did not end up eating our lunch, um, and China was a sleeper. Uh, and there's lots of things that we get wrong and then there's things that we get sort of right, but not necessarily in the way that we would expect. So uh, mobile phones. Uh, for a long time, we called them car phones because they didn't work inside. And uh, now how many people here have no landline? A lot. That was not obvious to anybody that you would ditch the landline. Um, in Kenya in 2007, if you wanted to send money home, you would put it in an envelope, write your relative's name on it, go to the bus depot, and find a bus headed to your village, give it to the bus driver, and then say, hey, you know, give it to my aunt. Um, it was not the most secure way of, of conveying value. Uh, and there were, in Kenya, there's very few people who have um, monthly plans on their phone. They kind of buy minutes as you go. And you can buy minutes, it's like this little scratch off card, and then you put the code in. But you can also transfer minutes between phones. And what they found, what Safaricom found, was that people were transferring minutes, like for barter, right? And they actually said, well, you know, if we had our agents who sell these cards and who sell minutes, if we had them buy the minutes back, you'd cash out. And that was the birth of M Pesa. M Pesa, uh, I don't think to anybody was necessarily an obvious big winner. But these are some numbers on M-Pesa today. And it's not just, uh, it's not just M-Pesa. Um, there are, uh, 10 years later, there's now 170 million active accounts um, using mobile monies. They're active in 92 countries. Uh, they are interoperable. They can transmit value across borders. There's 30,000 transactions a minute, and about $22 billion a month gets conveyed on these systems. So, uh, and it's driven a lot of other digital financial services that people wouldn't necessarily have expected. Savings uh, facilities and borrowing applications. Um, there's one Kenyan bank that in 2015 uh, dispersed uh, $500 million worth of loans to mobile money accounts. Um, there's been about 50 million insurance policies bought with mobile money. And, uh, and for those loans, the non-performing loan ratio is about 2% versus globally about 4.3%. Um, and it turns out that if you can shut off someone's phone, they pay their bill. So, uh, so emerging markets, I think, uh, I think are an interesting thing for us to be thinking about, especially, as especially when transmitting value is so expensive to them. And, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. So in 2009, the global middle class had 1.8 billion people. And 52% of that was either in North America or Europe. In 2030, the global middle class will be 5.4 billion people. And 21% of it will be in North America and Europe. Um, I think that's OECD numbers or Brookings Institute. That's three times as many retirement accounts, three times as many savings accounts, three times as many trading accounts, three times as many uh, uh, businesses that need risk management products um, and uh, you know for financial services really what is it that we're delivering that's so physical it's a very digital business um, so bringing down the frictional costs really matters and one of the frictional costs is how you actually reach those customers and now we're seeing 
smartphones, internet-enabled smartphones, uh, at the $30 mark. And this really augurs well for our business. There's huge growth opportunities, even just from the learning curves that we've been through here in the States and in Europe. So, uh, so now I'm going to talk about cryptocurrencies. Um, you know, very simply, it's a digital currency. We've got digital products. That's not a bad fit. Um, you know, you can transfer across borders at very low cost, um, sometimes at no cost. And uh, I should have switched. Um, and Ethereum is even programmable. For distributed ledgers, you know, if you think about a brokerage, so much of the cost of a brokerage is in reconciling your transactions with your customer and with your clearinghouse and with your counterparties and, uh, and error fixes. And using a shared ledger where there's kind of one golden copy has enormous cost control implications. So, uh, so personally, I see it as, as our industry undergoing a new technological reformation. And I think it's as significant as the move from the trading pits to matching engines. Um, when, you look at, uh, when you look at cryptocurrencies and distributed ledgers, here's how I hope your context would be changed. I want you to ask yourself, is this the end or the beginning? Right? Because I think for anybody in, in you know, the early stage of their career, this is an important question. And uh, personally, I obviously think it's the beginning. And uh, you know, I've, it's, I think it's an incredibly exciting industry. I've loved being a part of it for the last 30 years. I couldn't recommend it highly enough um, you know, to join our industry. And I think that if you do, you'll find that the changes ahead, although I can't tell you what they'll be, will be exciting and, and could be wonderful.